You were really badly bullied at school. And who did you find to share that with? So when I first came home from the games in 92, my school said to me, what you need to do is come in with your medals. Once you've done Blue Peter, come back to school. We'll draw a line under it. We'll get on with your GCSEs. And I had a bit of a problem with uh, my year group and my classmates who thought, because I wasn't talking about it, I thought I was too good to talk about it. But it's funny because you, if I'd have constantly been talking about how good it was at the games, and then I would have had equally as, you know, I'd been called a big head anyway. So it was a bit tricky because I was this walking conversation stopper at school. And I remember I would be in the, the girls' toilet and I'd be in a cubicle and they'd come in and be talking about me. Who does she think she is? You know, she comes to school with wet hair and, you know, she never talks about what she's doing and she's never available at weekends and she's always rushing off after school or she's gone running at lunchtime. And what would generally happen was in the morning, we'd all have our set desks at the, it, within the form room to have registration, but they'd move themselves around so that I was kind of isolated, surrounded by the guys. And so then I would, you know, talk to them and then they'll be like, oh, look at you trying to get a boyfriend or, you know, just like nit nitpicky stuff. Mm -hmm. But of course it was difficult because they wanted to go to the cinema, they were doing sleepovers and I had this sort of parallel life in sport. So I told my parents about the challenges I was having um, and we, we tried to be as pragmatic as we could because you can't control somebody else's behaviour um, and if they don't like you, they don't like you. You're not going to be able to change that a great deal and because one of the sort of instigators of it was someone who'd been quite close to me. I knew her really well but she didn't like where my career was going, it wasn't where her career was going, maybe that was the jealousy side. So I would go to the library at break time to get work done, I would obviously go out at lunch time and then I'd leave school and I'd try and kind of avoid the, the situation where I was one-on-one -on -one with any of them or not, you know, me and against a few, as it were. Um, and it was just a, a lonely existence at school, but I think because I had this other life where my, my swimming friends were and my, my swimming career was and the aspirations I had there, it was worth it um, to suck it up and because I knew my, my career in sport would last a lot longer than bullying at school. Do you think there was a lot of jealousy over what you'd achieved. You've come back with your medal hall, you're on Blue Peter, you're in the local paper. Does, does that play a factor? That's a difficult age, 14. I think there was an element of uh, not understanding. And also, I'd grown up hugely at those games. I'd had three weeks in the Olympic Village with older people. I'd learnt the importance of, you know, that regiment of race day. Um, going through those processes as an athlete is completely different to being sat in a classroom and learning and rubbing shoulders and having to do interviews, having to think on your feet in front of a camera. And although it wasn't the same sort of coverage as we would enjoy now at a Paralympic Games, it was very much, you know, different to being a schoolgirl. It probably built a thicker skin on me that has helped in sport as well. If your competitors don't like you or you, you come across a, a setup in coaching that you, know, you don't get on with, you need to be able to kind of like not react, not react, retaliate all of the time. And so that emotional side of things, you have to be able to regulate. And I definitely learned to regulate the emotional side of it at school. But did that at any point cause you any problems? I used to take my own lunch or I used to go and buy my lunch in the local village because after a certain age you were allowed to leave school at lunchtime and come back. But I stopped eating really. I didn't. I went out at lunchtime just for a walk. I didn't go and buy any food. Um, I would have an apple or something and I'd come back to school and then I'd pick my way through my dinner after school and I lost a lot of weight in that first term, term and a half at school. Um, and it probably wasn't until the following February when I went to the National Junior Swimming Championships that one of the other parents who was looking after their son or daughter on poolside said to my dad, has Sarah been ill over Christmas? I was painfully thin and it wasn't a great situation because I didn't really want to eat during the day at school. I was kind of like eating by myself, but I didn't really feel hungry. It was just probably the only thing I could control during the day was the food intake. I couldn't control the behavior of the other kids so I could only control the eating. And it was probably another few weeks later that it, I wasn't gaining weight, I was still too skinny. Two things I recognize happen in sport. One is you get mental illness, which will get the depressions, obsessional compulsive disorders. But the second thing is I've recognized that the girls try and cope with this, but it becomes a very dysfunctional coping strategy. So we get a lot of self-harm with cutting, uh, starving themselves, 
uh, or even overeating, uh, and it's dysfunctional coping strategies which present them with their own problems. And that just escalates this feeling that this young person is out of control. And unfortunately, I have met with elite sport a lot of condemnation of this instead of empathy and understanding and actually helping them. My mum said to me, we really need to go and see the GP now because it's important that we make sure that you're healthy. And the GP took one look at me and said, you could do with a jam sandwich. <laughs> um, and she said, OK, Sarah, um, I understand that you're having a, a tough time, but um, if you don't eat, then you'll, you'll not be able to compete in any sport. And she said, what I need you to do is I need you to do with me a food diary and I need to see that you're eating healthily enough to be an athlete because it's really important to me that we don't lose you. And she said, if I don't put you through this process and I send you down the hospital route, you'll forever be in a system that's trying to support you for having an eating disorder. And I think your eating is disordered. It's not an eating disorder yet. So if we can get on top of this now, then that will save you a lot of appointments and a lot of other things that you need to go through for us to help make you well.